Hi, I'm, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Lenore Zook Hughes, 1906 to 2001. Lenore Hughes was a sister of uh, Gertrude Ray and Helen Lacey. She was the granddaughter of Tom Zook and the niece of Nettie Zook. And this is a, an interview I did with her in um, August of 1989. And it was a ZFMC, or Zook Family Memories Collection, number 29, or ZFMC 29, published on May 1st, 1990. We are in the month of August, 1989, in Lakeside, Ohio, on Lake Erie. And with us today is Lenore Zook Hughes. Lenore, I thought it would be interesting for the family to hear about the people that we all have in common. And those are your brothers and sisters. You were saying that you didn't have as much of a knowledge as some of your other brothers and sisters because you were away, but your experiences were what they were. Maybe you could start with Mary, and I could follow up with some questions. That sounds good, Peter. Anyway, I was the eighth child of Mom and Dad's, and I was born a very healthy child. I was Aunt Nettie's namesake, so for that reason, she came when I was about four months old and took me to Ed Vale's studio, which later, which later on Dale and I bought. They took me up there, and Nettie held me in her arms, and they had me completely undressed. The picture was darling. I was a wide-eyed, chubby little gal. But from that exposure up there, I suppose that studio was cold. I got a childhood disease that made me very, very ill. They thought Mama got up a number of mornings and told the others, Fred particularly, that they weren't going to have a little sister by noon. When I was a year old, I weighed 10 pounds, so it really did affect me physically. I had a wonderful childhood. I really loved my father. Because I was sickly, he would rock me. I remember him rocking and rocking and rocking. One of the other memories of my real early childhood was Aunt Edith Warner being in her house. They made me sit in a high chair in the kitchen. At the, at the time, I was three and a half, maybe four years old. I was so insulted that they made me sit in a high chair. I wanted to be grown up like the rest of them. <laughs> oh, it was fun. That was one of my first recollections. My brothers and sisters were always very kind to me because they thought I would, uh, I was a sickly child and I was. They were always wonderful to me. Fred was the one when I got a little older. My mother would have Fred look after me when he got home from school, help me get ready for bed at night. I can remember giving him a lot of hard times. I was sharp enough. Mary was my oldest sister, and I had her in the second grade as my teacher. I must have been a real stinker, because I would not call her Miss Zook. I didn't call her Mary. I didn't call her anything. I would call her Mary if I called her anything, and then she got aft after me for that. Then I wouldn't call her anything, which was probably an arrogant attitude. Was she a good teacher? Oh, she was a wonderful teacher. Mary was a very kind person. She was a wonderful gal. All through my life, Mary was like a second mother to me. She married Frank Fralick when I was eight years old, and from then on, each summer for a three-month period, I went to live with Mary Ann Frank. I complimented myself that I was helping her work. She did pay me. I think she started with a nickel a week. <laughs> I probably wasn't even worth that nickel. Anyway, I helped Mary a lot. I was there when Barbara was a little girl. She was born early in the spring, and she was a darling baby. When I got there by the end of June, the day school was out, I can remember bathing, bar bathing Barbara as a little child. They had a wood-burning stove in the kitchen and an oven door that opened. I would sit on a chair in front of that oven door with a, with a basin, a towel in my lap, and Barbara. I was giving her a bath. Mary came to the door, and I must have been a funny sight because I wasn't too big then. And Mary laughed at me, and that made me mad. I wrung out the washcloth and took one shot at her, and I hit her. <laughs> I'll never forget that. When I would go home in the fall, I would get homesick for Mary's because I had such fun. I always had a lamb, and I always had a dog out there, but no other children. 
One day Mary said, Well, you've been working pretty hard. I'm going to fix a picnic lunch, and you go down to the woods and have your dinner there. I was alone. I toddled down with my little brown bag, but when I got there, there were about 15 vultures. They're ugly things to begin with. I looked at them, and I unwrapped my sandwich. They came closer, and I thought, Oh, I can't have lunch here. Ha, ha, ha. I went back to the house. We had a lot of good times there. We'd play rook in the evening. They were good times. I'd ride on the corn planter with Frank if I had a day when there wasn't much doing. Would you see the rest of the family at all in the summer? Yes, because if I got homesick for the family, there was an inner urban train. I'd walk down to the end of the road, which was about a half a mile, and I would hop on the inner urban and ride into Marion. Didn't Gertrude stay with Mary when she was teaching school? Gertrude stayed with Mary during the week because she had a one-room schoolhouse out there. She would go on Sunday night and come back on Friday afternoon. I wasn't very old then either, but that was school time, so I was at home. I would walk to the urba, interurban station and wait for Gertrude. I did that every, every week when she got home. We had a real good time. We'd always stop at the bakery on the way home and have a cream puff or something. That would be on Friday after school. She would be coming home for the weekend. I don't have too many early recollections of Helen, except of Helen and Gertrude practicing in the parlor. Helen, would, Helen played the piano, and Gertrude had her little violin. The two of them would just, it seemed to me, make heavenly music. A little later on, Fred took up the mandolin and Theodore the cello. There would be all kinds of practicing going on. Helen in the front room on the piano, Gertrude in the, ne in the next room with her violin, Fred in the dining room with his mandolin, and Theodore with his cello. Our house was always full of music, beautiful music. Later on, Fred and Theodore were, were in jazz bands in Cleveland, and they would bring these boys home with them, sometimes ten of them. The neighbors would gather in our front yard because the jazz band... The jazz band filled our house practically, and they would just entertain the whole neighborhood. It was lovely. Rachel was, was one that was always very close to me. She was a beautiful gal with a lovely voice. She was a good Christian. After Rachel was born, I would say to my mother, Throw her out! Throw her out! So Rachel was always a bit jealous of me, because I got special treatment, because I was sickly. Tommy was born when I was ten years old. I remember standing in the front yard under the cherry tree, and they said that Tommy had been born. I didn't know whether to be, to be proud to have a little brother or upset at the thought that we had enough children. Anyway, we all accepted him, and he was a nice, beautiful baby, and Mama loved him dearly. How many kids do you think your mother would have had if it had been her choice? Well, Papa and Mama were both very religious people and they would not have curtailed their family. There was a four-year gap between Theodore's birth and my birth because Theodore had had a very bad birth. Grandma Hecker was Mama's attending midwife. Theodore was hurt, and my mother was hurt. So after that birth, Mother had a woman come to live with us to help. Was that when Helen did so much of the work at home? Well, the time when Helen did so much work was when she was teaching, and my mother was going through the menopause. She was extremely sickly. She was in bed, oh my, four years, I think. At that time, I was just out of grade school, in high school, so I looked out for myself. I think that made me a very independent person. I remember I made my junior prom dress. I went to the department store and bought the material. I hadn't figured the pattern right, and my underskirt was a little below knee length, but my overskirt went down to my ankles. I must have looked very strange. But I wore it proudly, had made it myself. I wore that same dress to Gertrude and Doran's wedding. They were married in the German Methodist Church, probably because it was a little church. Rachel, I think, was married in Cleveland. I was married in the funeral chapel. John and Nell were married out of town. John came home with Nell as his bride on a Sunday evening and told my mother and father that they had been married. Nell was a beautiful, beautiful bride. 
Where did John and Nell meet? In high school, I think. John worked for the railroads. He was an avid union man. He was a nice person. John was very political. John was always political. He was a Democrat, and he was a political person. He was way too active in the labor union, and I think perhaps he made some enemies at times. Particularly, the family didn't like it, because we were all Republican. Tommy turned out to be a Democrat, too. Do you remember about the family gatherings? Well, the family, the aunts and uncles, and the whole family were very closely knit. We would always have Thanksgiving together. When the first flu epidemic came around, and it was a bad one, we had Thanksgiving at Aunt Susie Rydenbaugh's. All of us were exposed to that flu. Many of us had it, and it was a real terror. Who were you closest to? I would say I was closest to Mary and Rachel. Rachel was my roomie for many years. Gertrude always went out with the boys and played baseball. She would be the one Mama would have to call at night. We had to be in before the streetlights were turned on. Every evening after dinner, we'd congregate in the living room, and Papa would read to us, mainly animal stories. Mama would sit there and knit. She always had a basket of stockings to mend. It was a wonderful home life, and we started our mornings with prayer for the whole family. We would congregate in the living room, and my father would read a passage from the Bible. We all knelt down and prayed. That has stayed with me. Why did Rachel become a loner later in life? Well, Rachel and I were both married during the Depression. Jobs were extremely hard to get. David, like all the other men of that time, could not get the job that he wanted, and he gravitated from one job to the other. They moved I don't know how many times, at least 15 or 16 times. She was raising children, and when you live in a town away from Marion, Marion, you don't get to see much of the family. Rachel was busy with her children. She had four. David died very early, and that's when Rachel turned inward. Socially, she did not participate much. We, had all, we all had our own things that we were doing. There was not much time. Did she ever get over losing her daughter, Marilyn? No, I think maybe that was the beginning. She felt sorry for herself, and I can understand why. Marilyn was such a beautiful, lovely daughter. It was such an awful loss. Rachel, when she found out that Marilyn was ill, they had taken her to City Hospital in Cleveland. She called Theodore. He was a practicing physician in Cleveland. She called him late at night. She said, Theodore, will you look, look in on Marilyn, see what you can do to help? <coughs> he waited until morning, and by the time he got there, Marilyn had died. This laid heavy on him. It really did. Could they have saved her? No, no way. It was a blessing that she died, because we had a friend in Marion that had polio that same week, and still she is alive. She's outlived her whole family and has been a dreadful burden. Marilyn must have had a very severe case of polio, left three little children. Gertrude and Helen had a wonderful life together. Because of their music, they went to Yellowstone Park. There they would entertain, for which they received no pay, but they got their board and room. They also had to work in the daytime. Gertrude met her husband there, Doran Ray. Right from the start, just like I did with Dale, she knew that Doran was the one for her. What do you remember about Doran? Oh, I remember his first visit to our house. He'd brought his cribbage board and his cards. My father promptly removed the cards. There were no cards allowed in our house. Later on, my dad wasn't really that. Did he ever play cards himself? No, but he enjoyed games. We played Scrabble and all kinds of games. Now, Helen and Gertrude were close, but didn't they have different personalities? Well, they had different personalities. Helen always was more cultural, had that bent. Gertrude was always more practical and a little more sensible. Gertrude was married first, and I think fell, Helen left, felt left out. Ted, as a little boy, was always a tinkerer and experimenter. We had a beautiful walnut dresser in the back bedroom. Theodore had a Bunsen burner and all sorts of apparatus. 
Boy, an experiment. I was always his stooge. When Theodore's experiments blew up, I had to do the cleanup. Theodore and I were always pretty close, and Fred and I were always pretty close. We visited Ted in California several times. He retired early. Tax-wise, he was just about as well off not to work as to work. Ted was always very opinionated, like most doctors. They think their ideas are, and if they didn't, they wouldn't be a doctor. They have to think what they do is correct. He was an artist. He did a lot of painting out in Santa Barbara. He had some very beautiful work. Gertrude, Helen, and I also all painted. Ted had studied anatomy to know the muscle structure of the body, so his paintings were very accurate. He was good. Ted started raising orchards after we did. We went out there and got him started. Ted had really big orchard, or, orchids, orchid houses out in Santa Barbara. I don't think he ever did come back to Ohio. He and Evelyn used to come visit Dale and me in Michigan. Your dad ran for judge in Marion in 1916. Probate judge. He did not have a legal background, but he was well respected and he had a fine mind. He made a very good showing. I wonder how he would have done if he got elected, not being an attorney. He would have been very fair, I can tell you. Papa was a knowledgeable man and an avid reader. He kept himself very well informed. He was as well qualified as many of the people we've had. Did you work on his campaign? Oh, sure. He had an excellent picture taken that was on his cards. Did you go around telling people to vote for him? Well, I was pretty little then. I thought he should have won. I was very proud of him. We had a wonderful childhood all of us, and we were all different. It seems like there was an awful lot in common. There was, and because we lived sort of in a family compound, there were many cousins around. Robert Hecker and Catherine lived right next door to us, and Aunt Molly, they were always over at our house. Aunt Molly would send them over to get their baths, as if Mama didn't have enough to do. There was always something doing. My mother and Catherine's father were brother and sister, Ferd and Lena. They lived right next door to each other their whole lifetimes. Catherine was the daughter of Ferd and Molly. We were cousins. Catherine married Merle and I married Dale, twin brothers. Do you remember your Uncle Ferd very much? Oh, yes. Very quiet, pleasant person. In his younger days, he was an expert carpet salesman. He knew his carpets from beginning to end. Having a German background, did you have any feelings of German nationalism when you traveled to Germany? Well, I think some of our background is Swiss. Some of Papa's background was Scotch-Irish also. I've always felt that the Zucks had Germanic characteristics, from my dad and Gertrude, the Protestant work ethic. Well, you were 14 years old when Warren Harding from Marion, Ohio, was elected U.S. president. He ran his campaign from his front porch. He didn't go to make speeches. People came to Marion to hear him, which was a novel idea. Did family members work on the campaign? Oh, John Zook worked on the campaign like you wouldn't believe. Many of the movie stars came to Harding's home to hear him speak. John was one of the first in the parade, holding a banner. Do you remember listening to Harding's speeches? Oh, yes. I know that, I know that Harding did coin the phrase... Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. John F. Kennedy took that from Warren G. Harding. And your brother John was a delegate at the 1960 Democratic Convention for John F. Kennedy. Do you remember talking with him about that? Was he very excited? Oh, he was very excited. I remember after Ted was so badly burned as a boy that Grandma Hecker came over one day. She said, Lena, if you don't straighten his leg out, he'll always be a cripple. Grandma Hecker pushed down on that knee, and did he scream? I was always close to Gertrude and Rachel. Helen and Tommy were close. We always had a good time. We always worked together, did things together. If John started talking politics, we just sort of ignored it, and it died. Your dad, John, was a cute baby. Gertrude and Doran lived in the second house from Mama's. 
We'd go over there after school, and if I had any problems, I'd lay them on Gertrude. She was your confidant. She sure was. She had little John and Dick. John and Dick both got rheumatic fever. That was a sorrowful time, a worryful time. Gertrude took them to Florida one winter because the doctor was afraid to have them in Ohio for the cold winter. John was always full of pep. They were a wonderful family. Carol was the sweetest little girl, and they just adored her. I've been amazed by my dad's college diary, his personality. John is John. I remember Papa saying that when he got out of that orphanage, he wanted a home with children, and believe me, he achieved that goal. I think Mama and Papa had a rough start of it after they were married. He was frustrated and upset. He hadn't found himself. I can remember Mama telling us he was ill. She would try to give him his medicine, and if she even touched his lips with that medicine, he would be very angry. He blamed Mama. One night, they went to an evangelist meeting at the Prospect Methodist Church, and Papa finally, as a result of the minister's talk, must have taken a look at himself, and with that he said, It's my fault. He no, he no sooner said that than he went down front and began to pray. He had a real conversion. He went back to my mother and said, I'm sorry, forgive me. From that day forward, I never heard an unkind word from my father. When my mother, one of the last things I remember her saying was, Lenore, Papa really loved me. That's a wonderful realization after the life that they lived, the things they had to endure to raise that family. I think that we can be proud of our family. We've kept very much in touch with one another because of your dad and his father. Somebody has been helping us keep together. And Peter, we always should. I think, Peter, with these ZFMCs, you have the makings for a very interesting book. There are different personalities in our family. There, there really are. Some of them are idealists living in the clouds. Some of us have our feet on the ground, face facts, and move on from there. It's strange. Helen and Tommy wanted more, perhaps, than they were able to deliver. You are what you are, and you do what you do, and then you live with it. You cannot always have what other people have had. A lot of times it wouldn't be good for you, even if you did have it. I don't know if it was because my mother was ill when my ideas were formed, but I always made my own decisions. But we all have to depend on other people, and there are times when you become a little frustrated. You have to have good friends. You have to have good family, and I think we've had that great blessing. I thought Dale, my husband, was handsome. He was my ideal. He was a darling, darling guy. He always had a lot of ideas, a very loving, caring person. We've had a very good life together, 50 years. Not many people have that opportunity. A lot of people get married and don't get along and say, What did I do? What's to become of us? A lot of them go the wrong direction. Dale added an awful lot to Lakeside. The thing I remember is Dale coming up and saying, Dale Hughes is my name. It never got corny, even though he said it every time, every year. It was always funny. He always had a sharp line. He always said something unexpected. In the photography business, we had a busy life. We needed to get away, so we started early, about 1958. We took our first trip to South America. We were in Argentina after, after Peron, and they wouldn't allow his name to be mentioned. They really had an awful rain down there. They were cruel people. Now again, Juan Peron, that party's back in power. Uruguay was wonderful. Really, South America was something. I always have adored Ireland. We've been there many times. I would go back again today. I loved Italy and Greece. The Irish were so generous, and it's a beautiful country. In Saigon, South Vietnam, we met some of our boys there, American troops. They knew the month, day, and minute they were coming home. The Vietnam War was a war which never should have been fought. That was terrible. In 1968, after Greece, we went to Germany, and that was a fantastic experiment. Then we went to England. 
As I recall, we took the first 747 airplane back to our country. I couldn't believe that that many people, 340, would get on a plane. One year, Helen Lacey was in Florence, Italy for three months, and we were there for two weeks during that time. Helen always traveled extensively. She loved it. She went, she went with three other women from Oberlin College. Salzburg, Austria is a beautiful, beautiful town. I can remember one train ride we took from Lucerne, Switzerland, back to Milano, Italy, and we went through some of the most gorgeous mountain scenery. Oh, that was wonderful. In Africa, we went to Cairo, Egypt, and along the North Shore, but we never really got into Africa. Theodore, my brother, advised us not to go to Africa because of the many health hazards. He was afraid of the tsetse fly. We've been to Japan five or six times. Wonderful. New Guinea, oh my, real primitive. We were on Pitcairn Island. Captain Bly really got around, and so did Captain Cook. You know, Lenore, one of the nicest things anybody ever said to me was at your wedding anniversary in 1986 in Marion, when you said that Gertrude would have been proud of me. She would be Bert. She would be Peter. She held, you held a very special place in her heart. She would be very proud of you. I told her I was going to be all right when she was dying. Good, good for you. Oh, she would have read the ZFMC by the hour. Gertrude never lost her sense of humor. Helen always wanted to, to dominate her, and she never did. Ha, ha, ha. Wouldn't Grandpa Zook have been so extremely proud of our family? He would have been most proud of you boys. He was a good, kind, understanding person. I wish I had something he wrote. Well, he was so busy earning a living for his family. I don't think he had much time to write. He had the information. Do you, rem do you rem remember the novels that the family used to read? <coughs> well, The Scarlet Letter was one. How much the world has changed from that time to, to today. I can't believe the wonders that we've seen. Sometimes I think we aren't thankful enough. It's fun to learn everything you can about the unknown that you can dig up. We had a good chance, a loving home, loving parents, and I think our family has done remarkably well. It's amazing all the people and things they've done that have come from your parents. That's the right word, amazing. <laughs> it must have been hard for you. Losing your husband, Dale. Well, it isn't the easy things that make good people of us. I think sometimes the hard things are the things we need to learn. There's a lot of good in living. Lenore Zook Hughes. Now we have some comments. The first is from Alice Ray. I got a lot of wisdom from what she's... I had a nice time reading your interview with Aunt Lenore. She's a great lady. I got a lot of wisdom from what she said. Alicia G. Garcia, Quezon City, Philippines. And the next comment is from John S. Ray. ZFMC number 29 just received and devoured. What a pleasure to read about Lenore's memories of growing up in Marion. She told about a number of things which were new and very interesting to me. Your duties as family historian are being discharged 150% by producing the ZFMCs, and number 29 is a classic example. Thank you. John S. Ray, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. And the next comment is from uh, Jim and Katie Zook. We really do love the Zook family mementos. Keep up the good work. I'm enclosing some money to help with postage. Jim and Katie Zook, Sandusky, Ohio. And the next, the next comment is from Roberta Zook, quote, My sincere thanks to you for your many efforts in compiling the Zook family booklets. I read all while visiting Lenore in November. They are something to be treasured. I would like to be on your list as well as receive all the ones you've done. I'm sure my children, Charlene Zook Crawford and John Marshall Zook, will be fascinated. Roberta Zook, Denver, Colorado, USA. 
And the last uh, comment is from uh, Carol Wiesenauer. Quote, In case we've never mentioned it, your ZFM effort... Your ZFMC efforts are truly appreciated. You have been a fine historian for our family. Now you are about to enter a most important chapter of your own life. Be happy. Carol, Carol Wiesenhauer, Pinehurst, North Carolina. So that concludes today's uh, talk about the life of Lenore Zook Hughes, my grandmother's sister. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Good luck with your own efforts if you are, if you, if, if you are doing them in your own family to... Uh, Find and preserve old old letters and diaries, and interview uh, elderly family members and m members, and to uh, preserve history and, and perhaps share them with the public or or with family members. So thanks again so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.